Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com. I hope you're all doing well. Hope everybody's healthy uh, here in Tennessee. It's been a very good day, a little warm still, but hey, every day is a bonus. So I am thankful to get to be with you guys. Thankful, I say it a lot, but I'm thankful every time. Uh, been packing up stuff today, getting ready uh, to do a show. So thankful for that. And gun going to talk today though, uh, about a really cool gun that is a lot cooler than the price tag lets on. This gun, on first look, oh, it's a Colt. No, it's not. It is a Colt competitor. It's basically the same gun. It looks very, very similar. But this is the one known to collectors as a Manhattan Navy revolver. And again, we mentioned in the earlier ones, when you hear that word Navy, doesn't mean it was used by the Navy. That's regarding the uh, size of the bore of the gun. A Navy is a 36 caliber in Civil War lingo. Army is 44. Both big bore guns could impact a lot of damage. This one is the Manhattan Navy 36. They made uh, a little over 78,000 of these. So that's a lot of production. They were made by the Manhattan Firearms Company, which makes you think it's uh, New York, but actually they were all made in Newark, New Jersey. These guns were made between 1859 and 1868. In 1868, they were bought out by the American Standard Tool Company and continued to make guns, but they will have a different marking. This gun, though, they made 78,000 like this. This is the first series, which is a little more desirable to collectors, and there's a couple of things you can look for on it. The early version of these uh, will have Manhattan Firearms Company, New York. Even though they weren't made in New York, uh, people assumed that it's better in New York than Newark, New Jersey, where they were actually made. So the first 14,500 of them were made uh, with that New York marking. About 14,500 to the end of production, they're marked with the Newark, New Jersey location. So a little bit earlier, uh, people like that New York marking. Another way to tell, all except that last series, which they made about 9,000 of them in that last series, uh, will have a five shot cylinder, uh, meaning it can hold five rounds. The last series is a six shot. So looks basically the same, but they started renumbering them from one to 9,000 with that six shot frame. So a lot of times if you're not looking for that barrel marking and you see uh, a low serial number, you're like, hey, that's good. Uh, no, it's not, because to a Civil War guy, those are post-war. Those guns uh, are estimated to have been made between June 1867 and December 1868. So that last 9,000 had nothing to do with the Civil War. Still a collectible gun, but not Civil War. So we've got the gun, five shots, uh, 36 caliber bullet. They show up in different barrel lengths. They show up in a four, a five, and a six and a half. The six and a half is more desirable uh, with, with guns, usually bigger is better. I'll leave that there. You can talk about it amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the book, they say the, the six and a half inch barrel length is worth 25% more. Generally, that's, that's in the ballpark. This one is the five inch version. So it is popular. Uh, the Manhattan saw a lot of service during the Civil War. I've had a few dug ones uh, out of campsites and battle sites over the years. Had a lot of presented ones. A lot of these were gifted uh, to soldiers because all but one little batch were privately purchased. In late 1861, uh, the U.S. Ordnance Department bought one little batch of them. We don't know the serial numbers, and that's the thing. The serial numbers on these aren't like a Colt. You can't write to the company. You can write to Colt, and for a, a lot of their guns, they can tell you the date it was shipped for a fee, they, uh, which is pretty expensive, but it's worth it if you've got the right gun. Colt can tell you where it was shipped to, what configuration it had, what barrel length, what kind of grips, what finish, and the date it was shipped, who it was shipped to, and how many were in the batch. Uh, just had one a little bit ago, a 44 caliber that was shipped to Ohio, to the governor of Ohio. And so that's, that's kind of cool when you can find out that history. Unfortunately, with a Manhattan, we can't. 
unless it has a soldier's name on it, we don't know. And that's the way it is with a lot of Civil War guns. We can say they're Civil War era guns and they have a chance of being used, but you never know 100% for sure unless you have that name on it and some history to it. The guns themselves, five inch barrel, a uh, cylinder, and on the cylinder, check this out. It's got a cylinder scene and it's really pretty. A lot of times these are well-made guns. They're not just a, a fly-by-night company. Uh, Manhattan made over 150,000 guns during that time frame that they were in business. So they knew what they were doing. And the cylinder scene shows up like this. And it's very clear, nicely done. And that's just to make it a little more ornate. And Manhattan was one that if you had the jack, you could get it very ornate. They would go in and they'd put ivory handles or mother of pearl handles uh, in very ornate embellishment in the engraving. I've had them like that before and you do see them. They're a lot tougher to find than the comparable Colts, but Colts always bring more. Colts almost always bring more. There's always an exception. But the Manhattan is a really cool gun. In this condition, a Colt is going to run you fifteen hundred to two thousand, maybe a little bit more. These guns you can buy under a thousand dollars, which is still a lot of money. I get that, but comp uh, comparing the two, it's a lot of gun for the money. They're nice. This one has matching serial numbers, and when I was reading up on this, I was reading in Flatterman's, and they make a good point. It said, um, having a mismatch on the numbers does not make the gun not collectible anymore. It makes it less valuable, but it does not make it less collectible. Uh, people still like them because it was a tool. And it's important to remember that these guns were being used as tools. They weren't collector's items. These guys were using them to save their life and protect their homes. So they get worn out and that just happens. Uh, the guns, they have a brass on the back strap and trigger guard. This one's really pretty. It's got kind of a, just a deep, dark color that hadn't been cleaned. They use a one-piece walnut wood grip. And like we've talked about a lot of times, walnut was the wood of choice for gun makers almost always. This one has a pretty set of grips, action works, numbers match, good markings, serials, uh, cylinder scene is still visible. It's a good gun, and as of right now, it's on the website. You can go to the website, you can look at it, you can see it. I think I've got two or three others because I like them. Uh, they're affordable and they're neat, so I buy them when I come across them. Uh, go on to Shiloh Relics, check it out. We've got um, a little bit of everything on there right now. Um, I hope that you guys are doing well. I, uh, was trying to think about what I was going to say at the end of these because some some of you guys have said that you enjoy the end of the segments as much as you do the front, which means a lot to me. And I, I think every day I want to say something that's going to be positive and I want to say something that's going to be encouraging. Uh, and my encouragement this week was Sunday we got to go back to church for the first time since the COVID hit. And you know how you always hear a building is just a building because all of our, all our church is, is, is block. And I was sitting there after it was over and I thought it's block, it's wood, uh, it's concrete and it's glass, four things. And it shouldn't make it a special place, but it is because of the people that are in it. And I'm very fortunate. I've got, um, I've got a preacher lady. And she's very kind. She's she's kind to everyone she meets. I have never seen her be anything but good to people. And she leads by example. And I hope that I will always lead by example because people need good examples, good role models. Because most of the ro role, role models that are out there right now, they suck. And it, you should put those people that you see treating people the way they should be treated and treating people fairly and treating people honestly. You should put them on a pedestal because you can throw a ball or you can run fast. That don't make you a role model. That makes you a person with a talent and you should use that talent to be a positive influence on people, not an instigator, be positive. 
And I hope that you always look at me as somebody that tries to be positive. I fail every day. I will never walk on water because I've tried every day when I wake up. I, Today's the day. Maybe. But I won't. But I'll keep trying. And I will always try. So please, you try. Be that positive influence. Let people see you doing the right thing. Whether it's saying thank you. Whether it's opening the door for somebody. Whether it's being accepting when somebody that is on your last nerve, instead of yelling at them, instead of punching them, instead of anything else, be that person, bigger person. And I hope you guys are well. Thank you for taking the time to watch these. Thank you for taking time to uh, share them. Thank you for becoming a subscriber on YouTube. I appreciate you, and I'll catch you next time.